Story time with Stone. The Boarded Window by Ambrose Bierce. In 1830, only a few miles away from what is now the great city of Cincinnati, lay an immense and almost unbroken fucking forest. The whole region was sparsely settled by people of the frontier, restless souls who no sooner had hewn fairly habitable homes out of the wilderness and attained to that degree of prosperity which today we should call, well, indigents, than impelled by some mysterious impulse of their nature. They abandoned all and pushed farther westward to encounter new perils and privations in the effort to regain the meagre comforts which they had voluntarily renounced. Many of them had already forsaken that region for the remoter settlements, but among those remaining was one who had been of those first arriving, in fact. He lived alone in a house of locks surrounded on all sides by the great forest of whose gloom and silence he seemed a par, for no one had ever known him to smile nor speak a needless word. His simple wants were supplied by the sale or barter of skins of wild animals in the river town, and well, for not a thing did he grow upon the land which, if needful, he might have claimed by right of undisturbed possession. There were evidences of improvements, shall we say, a, uh, a few acres of ground immediately about the house had once been cleared of its trees, the decayed stumps of which were half concealed by the new growth that had been suffered to repair the ravage wrought by the axe. Apparently, the man's zeal for agriculture had burned with a failing flame expiring in penitential ashes. The little log house with its chimney of sticks, its roof of warping clapboards weighted with traversing poles and its chinking of clay had a single door and directly opposite the window. The latter, however, was boarded up. Nobody could remember a time when it was not, and none knew why it was so closed, certainly not because of the occupant's dislike of light and air, for on those rare occasions when a hunter had passed that lonely spot, the recluse had commonly been seen sunning himself on his doorstep if heaven had provided sunshine for his need. I fancy there are few persons living today who ever knew the secret of that window, but I am one, and as you shall see. The man's name was said to be Murloc. He was apparently 70 years old, actually about 50. Something beside years had had a hand in his aging, and his hair and long, full beard were white, his grey, lustless eyes sunken, his face singularly seamed with wrinkles which appeared to belong to two intersecting systems, in fact, like two faces. In figure, he was tall and spare, with a stoop of the shoulders, a burden bearer. I never saw him. These particulars I learned from my grandfather, from whom I also got the man's story when I was a little lad. He, uh, he'd known him when he was living nearby in that, them early days. One day, Murloc was found in his cabin dead. It was not a time and a place for coroners and newspapers, and I suppose it was just agreed that he'd died from natural causes, or I should have been told and should remember otherwise. I know only that with what was probably a sense of the fitness of things, the body was buried near the cabin, and alongside the grave of his uh, long-dead wife, who had preceded him by so many years. That local tradition had retained hardly a hint of her existence. And that closes the final chapter of this true story, except indeed the uh, circumstance that many years afterwards, in company with an equally intrepid spirit, I penetrated to the place and ventured near enough to the ruined cabin to throw a stone against it and ran away to avoid the ghost which every well-informed boy thereabouts knew haunted the spot. But there is an earlier chapter, and that supplied by my grandfather. When Murloc built his cabin and began laying sturdily about with his axe to hew out a farm, 
The rifle, meanwhile, his means of support. He was young, strong, and full of hope, and in that eastern country whence he came, he had married and was the fashion a young woman in all the ways worthy of his honest devotion, who shared the dangers and privations of his lot with a willing spirit and a light heart. There's no need uh, or no record of her name, of her charms of mind and person tradition is silent and the doubter is at liberty to entertain his doubt, but God forbid that I should share it. Of their affection and happiness, there is abundant assurance in every added day of the man's widowed life for, uh, for what but the magnetism of a blessed memory could have claimed and chained that venturesome spirit to a lot like that. One day, Murloc, returning from gunning in a distant part of the forest to find his wife prostrate with fever and delirious. There was no physician within miles, no neighbours, nor was she in a condition to be left, so to summon help was impossible. So he set about the task of nursing her back to health, but at the end of the third day, she fell unconscious and passed away, apparently with never a gleam of returning reason. From what we know of a nature like his, we may venture to sketch in some of the details of the outline picture drawn by my grandfather. When convinced that she was dead, Murloc had a sense enough to remember that the dead must be prepared for burial, and in performance of this sacred duty, he blundered now and again, did certain things incorrectly, and others which he did correctly were done over and over. His occasional failures to accomplish some simple and ordinary act filled him with astonishment, like that of a drunken man who wanders at the suspension of familiar natural law. He was surprised, too, that he did not weep, and surprised and a little ashamed. Surely it's unkind not to weep for the dead. Tomorrow, he said aloud, I, I shall have to make the coffin and dig the grave, and, and then I'll miss her when she's no longer in sight, but now she's dead, of course, but it's all right. It must be all right somehow. Things can't be as bad as they seem, right? He stood over the body in the fading light, adjusting the hair and putting the finishing touches to the simple toilet, doing all mechanically with soulless care, and still through his consciousness ran an under sense of conviction that all was right. That he should have her again as before, and everything explained. He had no experience in grief. His capacity had not been enlarged by use. His heart could not contain it all, nor his imagination rightly conceive of it. He did not know he was so hard struck that knowledge would come later and never go. Grief is an artist of powers as various as the instruments upon which he plays his dirges of for the dead evoking from some the sharpest, shrillest notes, and from others the low, grave chords, the throb recurrent like the slow beating of a distant drum. Some natures it startles, some it stupefies. To one it comes like the stroke of an arrow, stinging all their sensibilities to a keener light, to another the blow of a bludgeon, which in crushing benumbs. We may conceive that Murloc to have been that way affected for, and here we are on sure ground that of conjecture, no sooner had he finished his pious work than sinking into a chair by the side of the table upon which the body lay, and noting how white the profile showed in the deepening gloom, he laid his arms upon the table's edge and dropped his face into them. Tearless yet, and unutterable weary. At that moment came in through the open window a long wailing sound, like the cry of a lost child in the far deeps of a darkening wood. But the man did not move again, and nearer than before sounded that unearthly cry upon his failing senses. Perhaps it was a wild beast, perhaps it was a dream, but Murloc was asleep. Some hours later, as it afterward appeared, this unfaithful watcher awoke and lifted his head from his arms, intently listened. He knew not why. 
There in the black darkness by the side of his dead, recalling, all without a shock, he strained his eyes to see, knew not what. His senses were all alert, his breath was suspended, held. His blood had stilled its tides as if to assist the silence. Who, what had waked him and where was it? Suddenly the table shook beneath his arms and at the same moment he heard or fancy that he heard a light soft step, another sounds as of bare feet upon the floor. Well, he was terrified beyond the power to cry out or move. For perforce he waited, waited there in the darkness through seeming centuries of such dread as one may know, yet lived to tell, perhaps. He tried vainly to speak the dead woman's name, vainly to stretch forth his hand across the table to learn if she was there. His throat was powerless, his arms and hands were like lead. And then occurred something most frightful. Some heavy body seemed hurled against the table with an impetus that pushed it against his chest so sharply as to nearly overthrow him and at the same instant he heard and felt the fall of something upon the floor with so violent a thump that well, the whole fucking house was shaken by the impact. A scuffing ensued and confusion of sounds impossible to describe. Murloc had risen to his feet, feared by excess forfeited controls of his faculties. He flung his hands upon the table, nothing was there. And, well, there is a point at which terror may turn to madness. And madness incites a man to action. With no definite intent from no motive but the wayward impulse of a madman, Murloc sprang to the wall with a little groping, seized his loaded rifle, and without aim, aim discharged it. By the flash which lit up the room with a vivid illumination, he saw an enormous panther dragging the dead woman towards the window, its teeth fixed in her throat. Then there were darkness back of them before and silence, and when he returned to consciousness, the sun was high and the wood vocal was song of bird. The body lay near the window where the beast had left it when frightened away by the flash and report of the rifle. Clothing was deranged, uh, long hair in disorder, the limbs lay anyhow. From the throat, dreadfully lacerated, had issued a pool of blood not yet coagulated. The ribbon with which he had bound the wrists were broken and the hands were tightly clenched. Between the teeth was a fragment of the animal's ear. The end.